Hi, folks. Welcome to the iWrite Radio podcast. Hat Friday, as you may have guessed by the hats we both remembered this week. Um, podcast and video cast. I keep forgetting the video bit. Uh, we're, we'll have a quickie on the Nicholas Sturgeon press conference. I didn't see it today, so I'll be asking questions of you, Stuart. I hope you're no up to problem. Speed. Okay. And then I think the kind of big news today is that the mainstream media, i.e. The Guardian, the mm. FT, and The Spectator, all have pieces on Scottish, I'm going to put this in brackets, devolution, because that's mm. the kind of thrust of it, um, and independence. So we're going to have a chat about them. Um, and I think that could take us in all sorts of directions. Uh, so, Stuart, you, you watched Nicola today. Uh, what did you reckon? Um, can I introduce my friends first in the background there? They're, notice they're wearing hats. Oh, good. Okay. As they... is Che. See? It's just a hat day. All right. Um, okay. Yes, the press up today. Well, first of all, the surprise was, um, oh, I'll just give in that the BBC uh, presenter, Andrew Kerr, I thought it was far too cheery the way he introduced something that was going to start off with a list of ill and dead people. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't, I don't, it really annoys me presenters having the wrong manner. Um, the other thing that surprised me was the fact that it was back to the First Minister herself on a Friday. So maybe I was right about John Swinney last week. You didn't, you didn't think he did too badly when he, took, when he stood in for her, did you, last week? Well, I thought he was competent. Uh, I think it's difficult to compare many with Nicola Sturgeon. She presents very well. She's learnt, she's really, I would say she's probably come on a lot in six months, doing yeah. this six days a week. Goodness yeah, me. Yeah, I think if, so. If you wouldn't, if you don't. Right, what do we have today? Uh, no huge shocks and surprises about the, the figures. A thousand odd extra positive cases. Hospital, another 22. So we're still, in, still sitting at 1,200. Um, three more in intensive care at 88. And 32 extra deaths. So it's a terrible thing to say that it's just mundane results. It's definitely plateaued. That's fair, isn't it? Well, 32 sounds better than the 50s we were getting hmm. in deaths. Um, still 32 too many. And our commiserations and thoughts are with all of those who suffered a loss. The big topic today, before she was even asked any questions, of course, is if you live in a level, now level four, as of six o'clock tonight, local authority in Scotland, you're in a virtual lockdown. Well, you're not allowed to travel, are you? Well, you're not allowed to travel. I can't go to Musselburgh. Why? Because it's in. You're not supposed to leave your local authority if you're in a level three or a level four. Oh right, okay. Uh, and so the, I can't go to Musselburgh and I can't go to IKEA. That's why I asked you about I IKEA the other day. Well, I knew I knew IKEA because it's Midlothian. In Midlothian. Isn't it? aye, aye. So they're both in, down to level two as of six o'clock. That's why I thought you better cool. rush there this week. Anyway, so that was there were one or two things about that just repeated. Vaccination is becoming very, a, a very, there's a, hardly a news bulletin that doesn't mention vaccination. Uh, the first minister said they would have, I don't know whether it was a million cases or for a million people, you've got to remember that the first vaccination, they're expecting, uh, you need two, two doses. They're expecting a million before the end of January, which is... Uh, Right, so we don't know if that's half a million twice. No, it's my fault. I should have two million. Yeah. She wasn't okay. asked a question about that. This is one of our introduction things. What? Well, but then it got boring. <laughs> it really did get boring. Um, the only thing was the guy, the third person to ask a question was the usual border TV fellow. Guess what they asked about? Crossing um, the border. Um, 
Uh, um, um, Did they ask Nicola how she was going to get Boris to open the border that he closed? Yeah, well, that shows. First, first she says, well, in England, you can't leave your house, let alone cross the bloody border, because the whole of England's locked down. So he got telt there. Um, What annoyed me was he didn't point out that you can't cross the border from Edinburgh to (laughs) to Musselburgh, let alone go from Dumfries to Carlisle. Uh, I mean, the guy that does it never, he he never allows for the fact you can travel if it's for work. Uh, uh, You know, you you can go to work. I was shouting at the telly at Nicola, tell him, tell him I can't go to Musselburgh. God, don't make me. Oh dear. I used to go to Musselburgh quite regularly till the Aldi there. Well, I'm a bit disappointed because I was thinking about a wee trip down to that wee fish shop at the harbour. That's not a bad one, but you're not allowed to go there. Smokes its own kippers. Yeah, there before six. So I'm a bit, uh, yeah, well, there is that. I'll maybe send the wife out. Right, well, so there's loads of stuff there that I haven't highlighted. Over To to be honest, it's usually as you get down the list of uh, journalists, you, they're the younger, more junior, and they work for the tabloids, isn't it? So but what I finally got to, oh, I'm, I'm going to use a four-letter word here, the Scotsman fellow, Connor Matchant or something, Matt, Matt it, or whatever he is. I've called him Arse. I'm sorry. Teachers <laughs> have not been taken seriously. Um, and we'll get, well, I've got another quote about teachers. Um, Jason Leach says, you know, this guy was trying to, oh, safety and all the worry about teachers, apparently, the EIS strikes. This is a, they keep winding this up. They try to get something built out of it. Jason Leach says, well, I live with a North Lanarkshire teacher. So I know all about it. Screw you. I, what they're dying to happen is for the unions to take the teachers out on strike. That's what they want. They want teachers to turn around and say, right, we're no teaching unless you put us in diver suits because of the risk. And the unions who were involved, as far as I know, they were involved in the discussions about how to safely open schools. So either they've changed their minds or they didn't get their own way in, at, at, in those discussions. I Maybe they had to compromise too much. I, you see, if you recall about a week ago, the first minister herself was keen to tell us all about the results of a report that was uh, written about teachers and the the risks and the lack of risks that they're facing in schools and I I I, we didn't agree on this at the time but I I sensed that why was the first minister telling us all about this unless she was worried about this she was really happy to get this report and spin it well I, I do I think I mean it's another one of these things where you you've got to be thinking there's a high risk in schools just because of where they are and the fact there's a lot of kids mingling. So it's it's kind of, you think common sense, but if it's not happening, it's not happening. There's no evidence. Well, the, the only report I've seen, I think was from, it was an English report or it was an English newspaper. It didn't pertain to Scottish schools anyway, was that there was no evidence well, the teachers were at a higher risk. No, the, the quote was that the transmission, uh, the, ev- the sorry, the prevalence in schools in, in any particular area mirrors the prevalence in the community. Yeah. In other words, there's no extra yeah. infections in the schools, which is what they keep suggesting is happening. I say, but the, which I think is the, not, it's not the same as saying there is no risk. There's more risk being in a classroom teaching than there is sitting at home on a computer. Hmm. So I, I'm just saying it's, it's, I suspect, I sensed about, you could, it's like smelling fear when, when the first minister was so keen to tell us about this report, I could sense the other, some of these reporters or their bosses would have said, have a go at this. We sense a bit of fear in the first minister here. There must be something she's hiding. And I think that's why they're having a go. Well, it's a nightmare if if the unions, the teaching unions decide that they're going to strike 
I mean, working to rule isn't going to make any difference because of the, no, the restrictions that are already in place. Yeah. I mean, they go well beyond just working to the rule book. But it's a huge problem if teachers decide to go on strike because teachers then, that's them dictating that businesses close down because mom and dad aren't going to be able to go to work. Well, you know what the you know what the, the, the journalists are like. They're always trying to stir things up. So what they were trying to find out that, that today was what are the places that drive the transmission? You know, they want to know is it the pub, is it the shop? And there's the, they were told by the first minister, it's not a place. It's people that transfer. You know, it's people to people. And then again, that Jason Leach was there. So don't forget that's what made it different today because he's always you know. A great shield for her, and she, and he said, "Look, transmission takes place in homes, workplaces, and leisure places." And everybody's surprised when they actually catch it because nobody can actually remember where they exactly caught it. That and unless each individual premise has an individual version of the virus, as happened incidentally with the Nike conference. They could identify that virus and could say who it affected, who it hadn't. So unless you get labeled viruses for each pub and each theater and each bus, you're never going to be able to tell. And I, I, I cannot grasp why they cannot grasp that fact. They can, but they need to feed the, the tabloids the SNP bad story. Well, I know, but I mean, it, it just it just leads to confusion. I mean, you get on a bus with a guy that caught it in the foot of the walk, Boozer, and it's identified as hasn't, having come from the foot of the walk. Doesn't it mean you caught it in the foot of the walk? Just means you were in contact with somebody that did. There you go. It's, you know, it's impossible to take it down to that level. And, uh, we had some... We had a bit of comfort from Jason Leach. He was talking about AstraZeneca, and I think that they're, um, is that the Moderna one, or is that not a third one? I think there's three potential vaccines around that. Is anyway, not the Oxford one? Possibly, yeah. Anyway, they're a bit, very big major company. Uh, they have not passed safety level three, level three yet, but what he said, which was, sounded quite comforting to me, he sounds as though he's confident, which is good. He says, what they've, the, the, these uh, pharmaceutical companies have done, they've done eight years work in eight months. Yeah. That's, I suppose that's what happens when you throw money at them. Yeah. And, you know, they're all looking because they think there's, there's a wee pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for them. So then there's somebody else trying to, try to find out where was this transmission taking place? Oh, of course, they've always been accused of it happening in... Uh, in hospitals, what's what are the facts? You know, what are the what's the data for hospital acquired infection, staff, patients? So it's about one to two percent, and the figures are there to be found on on, on the government website. Well, that and that, of course, is the other thing. They don't want to go and find out the information themselves. They want the first minister minister to say something that can or or Jason Leach. They want somebody in authority to commit to saying something. So at some point down the line, they can accuse them of having told a lie. So the, the story is that things have changed hugely since the spring when it was a new virus. And they've got all kinds of, they've got all the PPE, they've got all the experience, all the routines and everything sorted out now. And uh, here's a quote from Jason Leach. Scotland leads the way on this. Papers handling like infection that. transmission in hospitals which is and again comforting i do i do remember when the nova virus thing was was at its peak that the methodology that the scott scottish national health used um to get on top of it was being copied all over the world i mean people from germany and america were across seeing how they did it um so that was never a headline that i remember well, there we go. Yesterday's story was um, that police in England 
are very impressed by Police Scotland, and uh, this is this is a conference of all the police uh, uh, forces in England, apart from the Met, and they're well impressed by Police Scotland. Shocking. <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> not according to our papers. It's not possible. <sighs> uh, well, the other one that came out of that particular conference was the number of uh, local police forces in England thought that maybe it would be a good idea to have one police force in England. I'm not sure. Just if... like Scotland. Yes, well, that's a possibility. I didn't get I didn't get that, that much detail, I must admit. Um, another thing that, to, that you will warm the cockle of your heart, <laughs> the Times fellow, we're getting towards the end now. And this is this is the fellow. He's usually worse than we we discussed this the other day as well. Mm -hmm. This guy's from the Times, and he's worse than the tabloids. So he comes out with a oh, blah, 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 blah. Teachers are terrified to go to work. Was his quote. First minister was having none of that. I don't under, I don't agree with any of your words. <laughs> I'm not going to reply to you. Well, we have a teacher friend who has ongoing health problems. Wonderful lassie, but she, you know, she has quite a lot of the year off sick. Um, and she doesn't seem that bothered. She actually hates the uh, virtual teaching, mm. which they have to do with some of the kids who are self-isolating. Mm. Um, because if you get a classroom situation, you can't throw anything at them. You I mean, you can't throw a a chalk. blackboard duster at the more, but right. well, I don't think they even have blackboard dusters and chalk in classrooms now. No, I suppose not. Is it not all sort of a computerized screen? Or a and whiteboard stuff? or a computer screen. Yeah. Um, anyway, so she said it's very difficult to control. Um, so maybe only one to one teaching will work. So anyway. She, well, the last thing was that Jason Leach, she, <laughs> the same, the same stupid hack Martin McLaughlin of the Times. So uh, Jason Leach says, well, the minutes for uh, these um, this, these meetings, apparently we discovered because he knew all about more than the, the bloody journalist. The minutes of the meetings are not all very, all the evidence you need. And I know the man, Mr. Goldenacre, that you quote, and he writes in broad terms, da, 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 and teachers are not terrified. So I think I'll leave it at that. Jason Leach really had his... I write him like that. <laughs> uh, well, today, saw the publication of, what, three articles? The Spectator, The Guardian, and The Financial Times. Yes, three London. All had articles on, as I said at, at, at the, the start, on devolution. Yes, devolution is a disaster is where these had all been based on, isn't they? Um, and all of them, uh, not the spectator, that was Andrew Wilson, um, who wrote the the latest tome on Scotland being tied to Stirling for the rest of his oh. lifetime. That's an exaggeration, oh, but you God, know what I mean. Get, do you want me to get going on Andrew Wilson? Because I'm Well, not not yet, not yet. <laughs> but but the other two, one was by Gordon the Beast Brun, mm -hmm. and the other one was another Kirkcaldy gentleman by the name of Henry Mance in Kirkcaldy. I have no idea who Henry Mance is. No, and they even, pub they even published f photographs of the beach and the, the promenade in Kirkcaldy. Is that the beach that's strewn, strewn with radioactive Second World War waste? Oh, that's Dalgetty Bay, you know, but uh... just up the coast of it. Honestly, it is the biggest pile of poo. I've read in it such a long time, but it was obviously set up. Oh, if this guy didn't speak to Gordon Brown, then he should be kicked all the way along the promenade at Kirkcaldy. Well, see, I think two things have happened that have brought Mr. Brun back to life. One is the, um, the spat between the, the northern mayors, the English northern mayors and Westminster. Yeah which has sort of reignited his devolution across the, the English counties. Um, and of course, Boris's comments on the disaster that devolution is in his mind. 
and that's what has reanimated the uh, the beast that is Gordon Brown. I think he sees an opening here to get English regions on side for a new devolved settlement. Yes, he's flagging up devolution again. And I think that the idea is to try and get Boris to agree to a section 30 on the basis that the referendum will have an option for devolution. It won't be a yes, no referendum. I think that's the, the nasty plan, isn't it? Well, yeah, but the problem with that is how how is Gordon Brown or whoever supports this uh, new devolution settlement going to persuade anybody that they won't just whip the powers off us when it suits them? They're not going to give us a veto on anything. You know, I mean, history proves devolution is power retained. And they're not going to give that up. Well, so it's where, worthless. That's where Andrew Wilson, and also there was an article by um, Moradura, Peter Curran, which hopefully I'll be able to talk about sometime over the weekend. Um, refute the idea that, what is it, the quote? Craig Murray comes up with it, I think, isn't it? The idea that... Uh, where is it? It's, it's talking about the internal market bill. And some people just don't seem to have noticed. They talk about the breaking the international treaty, the effect on Northern Ireland. And then they talk about ooh, food standards, as if this is the important part. The important part of the internal market bill, as you well know, is the fact that a cabinet secretary in London can overrule anything that the, dev the devolved parliaments decide. Well, we know that, but it doesn't matter to the English because they're already in that position. Any, any English authority below Westminster is overruled, is ruled by Westminster. So they don't care that Scotland, Ireland and uh, Wales are going to fall back into that position. I mean, to be honest, why would they? It just means that we, we're in the same place they are. I think you know, it's what annoys me, Matt, and that's why I was getting worked up, is that there's so many people in Scotland that should know better, don't, don't seem to have noticed. They're writing articles, so-called informed articles, and they're not necessarily uh, uh, unionists, and they still haven't noticed what's coming down the track. Well, I... I'm sorry, anybody that hasn't mentioned it that is an informed writer on politics in Scotland is ignoring it. You can't not have noticed. I mean, that simple, you can't not have noticed. So they have chosen not to make it an issue. There's not too much in what Brown says that we've, that he's never said before, but there's one or two gems. I like the one that he blames, um, the, you know, this outburst devolution has been a disaster. He, he became yet again, this is Brown speaking, the megaphone for the views of Dominic Cummings, who has spent 20 years opposing devolution. No, I never even knew that, he, that Devo, Cummings had an opinion on devolution, did you? Well, I would like Brown to have proven that exactly I quoting think that... something boris johnson has said in support of devolution the only time he supported devolution is when it devolved power to him as mayor of london well, yeah, there you go um that's the only time i mean what's a pound in, Cro in croydon worth yeah, well, as much is as one in strathclyde now that quote has to be coming on for 20 years old well, Brown refers to that indirectly. He says here, we have to worry for the unity of the country when the Prime Minister, who as Mayor of London, continuously argued for more devolution for the capital city, he now fulminates against devolution for everyone else. Well, and, and you know, that's an indicator. Do you seriously think Boris is going to give away power when as Mayor of London, he wanted to pull power to himself? Now that he's Prime Minister, do you think he's given it away? Yeah. Not going to happen. I think um, this article by Brown is all about Brown again. It's he is 
Brexit. You know, you people complain about Boris, it's all about Boris. When was Brown ever about anything about himself? Well, I, I mean, I cannot understand why he thinks any more devolution when it comes to the crunch will be of any more use to the devolved nations or the devolved regions when they decide to take a path that doesn't suit the Tories. Yeah. It's that yeah. simple. There yeah. is no way you're going to get the kind of power you need off a Tory government. You know, was it here? He says here, Brown says here, around the time I started in number 10, this is what I mean, and he's all about himself. He wrote that no Scot should ever be allowed to become prime minister of the UK. I think that must have hurt at the time. Eh? Well, this is Boris Johnson. So what are we talking about 10 years ago? Yeah, this is Brown complaining that Boris Johnson wrote this about him. Well, well, well. that's what I'm saying. That was 10 years ago. Why blame Cummings? Or is Cummings now, as I think I suggested, <laughs> about a week ago when he walked out of number 10, is Cummings now the scapegoat for everything? Uh, well, could be. Look, I've got here, I've got here, um, it's, a, it's a slightly longer quote than I want to quote, but this is Brown summing up the, the policy that he's got in mind, right? Um, fighting a Scottish election or referendum on the evils of devolution. No to independence, no to a referendum, no to change, simply plays into the hands of the SNP. It leaves the Conservatives defending an increasingly discredited status quo against an SNP that says there is now only one kind of change on offer, independence. And it takes the ground from under the feet of those who argue for greater devolved powers within the UK as a sensible well, way forward. Well, wait a minute. Right. You can cut his argument off by its feet right away because the status quo is devolution. Right? And it doesn't work. When did we ever have to have a vote for more devolution? We voted to get devolution. We've never voted for more, and we've certainly never voted to have powers taken away. Yeah, the problem is they voted in Wales for more devolution, and I think it was a possibility they might have had a choice to have some powers taken away, but they voted for more. Well, what about Scotland? We did. I would quite like a vote on the Internal Markets Bill, please. Yes. So you don't get a vote when they take power back. Do you really think they're going to give us the opportunity to vote for more power? No, I mean, anyway, uh, Brown, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm trying to remember what his acolyte said, his, or his interviewee, Henry, Henry Manson Kirkcaldy. Uh, I'm looking for a decent quote from him, but... Well, it was, it was Gordon Brown, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, I really not. I'll, te I'll tell you what I want to hear Brown say, and I'll believe him when he says it. We're going to have a vote on what kind of devolution we want. You have three options Devol Max, which is everything except foreign policy, basically, and including a veto. That's Dominion status, they used to call that, I think. Well, including a veto. An ability to rejoin the EU if Scotland chooses to. That's Premier. Okay? So that means when they want to um, put new nukes into the Clyde, we can say no. Bugger off, put them in England. That's the kind of veto I want. That's one kind of devolution I want to see on the table. And then he can water that down on another two options if he likes. But I want, if he wants me to vote on devolution, I want to vote on the kind of devolution. So I'm a bit worried about that you actually considering devolution. I mean, this would appear to me. Stuart, Stuart, I'm not considering devolution. I'm putting out the prospectus that if it's going to be democratic, we get to decide the kind of devolution we get. All right. I, and they'll I, I, never do that. It would appear. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, it's a bit late to me to dig out the, the definite quotes, but Andrew Wilson, the, the writer of the Growth Commission report, would appear almost certainly as a devolutionist. Everything he says, except he's 
he's an extreme gradualist, if not a devolutionist. I think he's just a devolutionist. And the worry is, this is what worries me, the moment he published that article yesterday, it came up, and it's not due in the official, you know, it's dated for tomorrow's spectator, but it came out on, on the online version yesterday. Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister, was one of the first people there to support, you know, she's in there on Twitter saying, oh yeah, this is wonderful. So what is she really for independence or is she for devolution if she's supporting I think she, Andrew that, Wilson? I, I think her position is very easy to sum up. I don't want a referendum till we're definitely going to win it. I think that's her position. Until I see pro yes in the 60s consistently, I don't want to take the risk. I think she's risk averse. Yeah, but the trouble is we could be running out of time. Look, if we haven't got it, look, we, one of the things we definitely needed in 2014 to get that referendum was a Scottish parliament and a Scottish government with an SNP, with a pro-yes majority. What didn't we? Now, if we take that ability away from us before May next year, where do we go? Well, Stuart, in our lifetime, We've gone from having no chance of independence to having a bit of a chance of independence to almost certainly getting independence. It might not be while well, we're still upright Alive. breathing, yeah. but the, the trend is definitely for independence. And, you know, I want independence before I die. Yeah. But. 25 year olds, 30 year olds, they can afford to wait 10 years, 20 years. It'll come. The state we're in when it comes, I don't think we'll be in a better position than we are now. But you never know. And you don't know. I don't I don't think you can ever accuse Nicola Sturgeon of being a devolutionist. I think she is a gradualist and she's certainly risk averse. And the the pandemic has proven in a good way the benefits of being risk averse. I think the big question I've been asking in the last few days is first of all, the, the impact of Boris's saying devolution in Scotland, north of the border, was the way he put it, wasn't it? It's been a disaster. The first question was when that came out was, did he mean it or was that an aberration? Well, it turned out at Premier uh, PMQs on Wednesday, he doubled down on it, and he was abusive. Uh, he he made it even he, you know he made it even worse. Well, he had his excuse. He called I didn't them the mean Scottish Nationalist. I party. meant devolution under the Scottish Nationalist Party. So he doubled down. He, he, he doubled down on insulting Scotland and the Scottish. Well, uh, and de delve into that statement. In, so he meant in, it. Well, in the context of Brown, delve into what he said. The devolution was a disaster, basically because the Tories weren't in charge. Well, it's, So it, it, why would he ever give more power, more devolution to Holyrood? Because the Tories aren't going to be in power in Scotland anytime soon. So you what, and then you got to ask right. So if, if they think if they think May May next year, this is our deadline, is it not? Perhaps it doesn't matter to Boris and his advisors who wins the election next May because the the powers of Holyrood will be so weak it won't matter who's in charge. Well, if the Tories win Holyrood, they'll give powers away. No, they're not going to win Holyrood. They, no, but abandon, what, no, but they don't I'm care saying, about winning Holyrood. In, in, in the impossible scenario that the Tories were to win Holyrood, they would follow Westminster. Yeah, but it's never going to get that far. What I'm no, suggesting no. is far more dangerous. That they would, they don't. Boris and his advisors are now saying, "Rod, we're we're going to lose." The, you know, the SNP are going to be in power in, in Holyrood next May. Let's just take all the powers away. Well, that's exactly what they've just done, and in the Internal Market Bill. That's what you and I agree, and we can see it. And, why, is, why is it not being shouted from the rooftops? Stripped, and they've stripped our MPs at Westminster 
English votes oh, for English laws. Oh, well, not even that. English votes for English laws are fine, but when they take the power away from the areas of devolution over which Scotland had power, mm. they've they've stripped our MPs and MSPs of all democratic power. I mean, as you said, a minister can override Holyrood under the um, Internal Markets Bill. Yeah. So effectively, that's it. Holyrood has no power. Yep. Not even a council. At least, at least local authorities have got uh, legal, they're backed up by the law, they have legal responsibilities. And I'll tell you something else that, you know, this is a way to strip the Barnett formula out of Scottish politics. Because you can bet your bottom dollar the first time they decide to build a road under the auspices of the uh, British government, the union, they will use Barnett formula money to do it. The union connectivity plan, well, is that what it's called? They have promised, Gove has promised that will not happen. And a promise from Gove is it's almost a dead cert that it will happen. Yes, it's a bit like a packet of salt and a packet of crisps. And, and the first time it happens, and our newspapers had better, they won't, but they better start screaming about it. Every single penny that's spent by the British government in Scotland better come from the Treasury and not from the Scottish budget. And you know where it, well, what Scottish budget? Well, that, I mean, what they'll do is basically the consequentials that come from projects in England, or mostly don't, Crossrail, HS2, etc. We're not going to have Barnet consequentials from that. But anything that's got Barnet consequentials, the British government will hang on to and use that to spend in Scotland. Well, can I just... I'm almost certain. I'd be rewind. very surprised if they don't legislate for it in some way. Can I just rewind? I haven't read many of the blogs overnight, so that I'm not going to get involved in the much in, in the disputes within the SNP and the S movement, but we do have the SNP conference coming up next weekend. This weekend we've got the Tory conference, Scottish Tory conference, plus the sub-conference, the, the, the outcome conference from AUOB last week. I believe it's called Yes Alba. They've decided to call this new organization. Well, possibly. Possibly. However, I did read the Andrew Wilson's piece. And here's, listen to this. What if the case for independence was a highly sophisticated position advocated by one of the most popular political leaders in the world? But if God, talk about fanboy. I mean, well, it's like, <laughs> and one on, on, you know. Are you a fanboy for telling the truth? According to Wings, Stu Campbell, he published his version of the panel base poll. There was a panel base poll about a week ago, and it turned out there were two or three different people, organizations that paid for one big poll with different questions involved in it. And um, I don't know if you saw Stu Campbell's question. Oh, they asked people, a thousand people, the same thousand people about the other questions about uh, would it make any difference if Nicola Sturgeon was in charge when it comes to uh, voting for independence next year? And it won't make any difference. The outcome of the as many people would change their mind as wouldn't. That's counterintuitive. Well, for you me, know, it's I, counterintuitive. I know it's counterintuitive to you, but who knows? Maybe it's true. Well, maybe it is true. I mean, great if it's true. Because the way Stuart Campbell and his cohort are going, she won't be there next for the independence referendum. I think I, I still think it's a risk not worth taking. Oh no, I can't be bothered with Andrew Wilson. It just makes me. I was. It's like and Andrew Kelly. Wilson is the Tory wing of the SNP. He's worse than that, you know. 
there is look yesterday i said and it's got to be true if they can put spy cops inside animal rights movements the british state has got moles inside the the, 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 the Stuart, independence movement Stuart, right you and i are not going to disagree about the fact that the british secret service has people in the smp and the yes movement of course they do that's their job do not please claim that Andrew Wilson is a member of MI5. I'm not saying so. I don't know who is. That's the trouble. Trying well, to identify these people. Gosh, I wonder if that's why their job is to spy. Of course you don't know who they are. <laughs> of course we don't. Not until afterwards. Ugh. And that's as may be. But I'm pretty sure that scattered through the, uh, the the Tory government, the Tory party, there's one or two, shall we say, friends of the Yes movement as well. I suppose, the, yeah, okay. The other, perhaps the other side of that, you know, I, I quoted you that, that, that he's a bit of a fanboy of Nicola and he suggested that she's so popular around the world that she's a, you know, that's what, all right. The issue is, well, do we need to get this referendum soon while Nicola Sturgeon's there and while Boris Johnson's there? Will it just be about Nicola versus Boris or rather about the, the whole, the, you know, the down to earth issue? I don't think we need to panic. The demographics of this whole thing make independence inevitable. So unless half of Scotland blows up, or there's some disaster as yet unseen, where we will be independent. So we, we have might to... not be independent in my lifetime, but we will be independent. So perhaps we should all vote, all of us independents, as old ones, we should vote for uh, the support the Tories because the the current current lot secretly believe in eugenics, and once they get rid of our generation, that's it. It'll be sort of seventy five percent for independence. Become a lemming. Yes, we should all just jump off the cliff for the good of the of our uh, children and grandchildren. Well, I'm not doing it because I vote yes. Ah, so that's true. So do I. <laughs> right. So no voters, yeah, do what you want. Vote Tory if you like. Uh, and on that cheery note... Oh, here, uh, I've got oh. a wee story to finish up with. Okay. All right. This is a clip from uh, the Daily Express in 1945. Well, hold on while I enable your ability to share. Oh, no, I, I, I've, I'm going to read it out. I can't. All right, OK. I'm going to read it out. It's short. Britain asks for whiskey to ensure a merry, merry Christmas. So this is at London, November the 19th, 1945. War in Europe's over. War in Japan, but Japan's over. First Christmas after the war. For the first peacetime Christmas after the end of World War II, a British newspaper called for a whiskey, usually exported to America, to be kept aside to boost people's spirits at home. And uh, here's a quote from it. Uh, Britain's approaching, this is from the paper at the time, Britain approaching the first peacetime Christmas in seven years, want a victory, not an austerity Christmas this year, including a little of that whiskey that goes to America so regularly, according to the Daily Express. Is, is that not how we paid our debt to America with Scottish whiskey? We paid our debt to America with, with all these islands and bases all over the world. We got 50 warships in exchange for Diego Garcia, Bahrain, all these islands and, you know, empire bases. Was Maharic a US base? I can't remember seeing the US in Bahrain. The Paras were there, but it was all British people. Maharic, the air base, I'm sure, was a British air base. All American now, it's the... Might well be now, yeah. It's the Sixth Fleet. That was in the 50s and early 60s I was there. Uh, yeah, well, we'll call it a day at that. Yes. Um, and thanks for being on, Stuart. And thank you very much for inviting me on. Um, Jimmy's tech let us down today. 
And as much as he didn't use it, he was too busy. So he might well, be he might be able to afford a pint tonight. He, he said he was stuck in ox gangs. Aye, aye. Yeah. But he has got other responsibilities too. Yeah, he's got his dad to keep up. And I've got head. to say goodbye from my friends here and from, of course, from uh, Che. You're too old to be idolizing Che Guevara, mate. Who said I idolize him? It's just a romantic figure. I've got the movie though. Oh, good. Have you have you got a copy a copy of his motorbike? Uh, the motorbike movie, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, we'll call it a day that. Thanks for watching and listening, folks. Day off tomorrow. We'll catch up with you on Sunday. Cheers for now. Bye-bye.